Welcome to another edition of America in Black. I'm Special Correspondent Ed Gordon. Decades ago, during America's war on drugs, a disproportionate number of black people were subjected to harsh sentencing laws. Convicted and sent away for years behind bars, some for life, often for nonviolent drug crimes. In recent years, many of these inflexible sentencing laws have been changed, but some of those caught up in the war on drugs remain behind bars. Kimba Smith knows all too well their predicament. She was sentenced to nearly 25 years in federal prison in connection to crimes committed by her drug-dealing boyfriend. When her story became a cry for criminal justice reform, she became a fierce advocate, and now the focus of a new movie. Nineteen eighty nine was the year public enemy blasted from the radio. The Detroit Pistons were NBA champs. The Central Park Five were wrongly charged with rape. And President George Bush was waging America's war on drugs. This, this is crack cocaine. It's turning our cities into battle zones. In response to the rising crime rates in America, especially in black and brown communities, politicians passed severe sentencing laws targeting those possessing and dealing crack. Kimba Smith never envisioned these laws would impact her. She grew up in the suburbs of Virginia and was a Girl Scout, musician, and debutante before attending Hampton University, where she began a relationship with a young man who would set her life on a path to prison. You weren't the stereotype. Two-parent home, middle-class upbringing, educated, you were in college, moving forward. When you look back now, do you say to yourself, how could that have happened to me? I was young, naive, impressionable, hadn't been exposed to much. It was during her sophomore year that Kimba met and started dating Peter Hall. So beautiful. Their relationship and Kimba's story is now being told in the new BET Plus movie, Kimba. Kimba's new boyfriend, Hall, was eight years older, and unbeknownst to her and her parents, he was a drug dealer. I'm nervous. So. Oh, <laughs> you don't have to be nervous. You're among <laughs> friends. What are you studying, Khalif? Uh, pre law. Kimba says she became an unwitting part of his drug trade. It's nothing. And a victim of his abuse. Is that what you want? <laughs> Trapped in fear, Kimba felt she had no choice but to stay with Hall. And when he landed on the U.S. Marshal's most wanted list, they were on the run for almost a year. I didn't know how to navigate that relationship and understand just how toxic it was and how risky it was, and eventually, getting in so deep, I uh, didn't know how to get out of it. Kimba became pregnant, and it all became too much. She turned herself in and, while in custody, gave birth to their son, Armani. She admitted making cash runs and eventually told authorities everything. Complicating the situation, Hall would be found murdered. And after that, prosecutors penned Kimba as the chief accomplice to his drug crimes. The prosecutor held me accountable for 255 keys of crack cocaine, even though I didn't handle, sell, or use the drugs. With Get Tough mandatory minimum sentencing laws in place, even first-time nonviolent drug offenders like Kimba faced drastic sentences. When the sentence was handed down, do you know exactly what that feeling was? That feeling was deep despair and disbelief that I was being sentenced, the judge said 294 months. I, I couldn't even calculate what 294 months was. Kimba was one of the disproportionate number of black defendants, many of them women, impacted by a series of harsh laws that included no parole and mandatory minimum sentencing. I still don't understand how the justice system could think that the daughter that I had nurtured and raised deserved to be in prison for that long. Kimba's parents, Odessa and William Smith, were beyond shocked by their daughter's plight. We didn't even understand what mandatory sentencing was. 
Nobody had ever explained to us. We never read about it in the paper. Why would we? What Kemba's parents did understand was their role in winning their daughter's freedom. We spent over $50,000 in long distance phone calls while she was incarcerated. We filed bankruptcy twice, but we knew we had to do that for her, no matter what. Black-owned media played a critical part in bringing attention to Kemba's story. One of the things that catapulted your story nationally was Emerge magazine. And had it not been for that magazine, I don't know that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund would have taken on my case. Politicians got involved, none more than Virginia Congressman Bobby Scott, who fought for Kimba's freedom for years. But when I see that kind of dedication from politicians, typically there's something even more personal. Was there something for you? She represented a really a poster child of the problem. She was given 24 and a half years. That is an absurd sentence. What happened to her represented what was bad about the criminal justice system. With the public's outcry for Kimba's release increasing and concern about the court's excessive sentences, President Bill Clinton would grant her clemency in December of 2000. How many days did you, leading uh, through this journey, find despair after you were released? <laughs> I see a bit of a quiver. Yeah, because I don't want to get too emotional. My feeling of despair was more so because I knew all of what was invested in me and knowing that most people don't have those resources. And I had two parents out there fighting for me. And so my despair was after I was released sitting in my bedroom and just tearing up because I knew there were so many people that deserve the same opportunity as I did. Kimba Smith is the exception. Not everyone has advocates or receives the national attention she did. Others have languished behind bars for three decades or more. Gloria Taylor is one of them. We spoke with her inside the Homestead Correctional Institution in Florida. I'm sorry for what I did. It was wrong and I got punished harshly for it. Unlike Kimba, Taylor did not grow up in a middle-class two-parent home. At 16, she started shoplifting. By 19, she was a mother. But like Kimba, Taylor had a boyfriend who was selling drugs. After some time, Taylor lost the boyfriend, but the drug trade remained. I did it for economic reasons. I didn't come up rich, and I chose that road. This road led to multiple arrests, and drug convictions before another arrest for possession of a handful of crack with intent to sell. Because of Taylor's previous multiple drug crimes, a judge deemed her a habitual offender and in 1991 sentenced her to life in prison. When that man said life, I, I, I just looked at him. I couldn't do nothing else. This is more rhetorical than anything, but what's been the bigger hell, being in here for 30 years or being away from your children for 30 years? Being away from my children for 30 years. It's been a lot. After Taylor was sentenced, the Florida Supreme Court ruled habitual offenders are not required to receive life sentences. But more than 30 years later, she remains behind bars. She is currently appealing her sentence. All of her previous appeals have been denied. Are there times you felt forgotten? Many times, but I've never given up the fight. Are there times in, in your darkness that you still shed a tear? Oh, of course, yes, I do. I do. I keep it private and I ask God to keep me on this journey to freedom. One day, I'm gonna get out. Since her release, Kimba Smith has worked to make sure women like Gloria Taylor are not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Dr. The same she was appointed to serve on Virginia's <laughs> parole board and continues to speak out for those who are still incarcerated. And there are tens and thousands of other women who may not have a life sentence, but they have children and families and whose lives matter. Kimba hopes the movie will focus attention on the need for change, to see more people convicted of nonviolent drug crimes released from long prison sentences. My focus is hoping to use my story to help humanize people. 
and to give other people a second chance. <laughs> Her parents have also devoted their time and energy to support Kimba's mission. Once she was free, you all could have said, thank God you're home. Now let's put this mess behind us. Tell me why this is so important for you all. We realize that, hey, it's not all about Kimba. God's purpose, your plan. Mm. So this is meant to be. So we're gonna be in this journey until the day we die. Mm. To change the laws, mm. to prevent this from happening to other kids, mm. and to bring some people home. Mm. It's still, it's still with you. It, it will always be with me. Mm. Always. Mm.